Lawrence, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure. Uh, I'm a professor of economics at George Mason University. I've been uh, in this business for 40 some years. I've uh, written a few books. My most recent book was called The Clash of Economic Ideas, but my other books are mostly about money and banking, and in particular, uh, history and theory of uh, privately issued money and monetary regimes where government's role is minimized. So what is uh, free banking or this idea that banking can have a way to function without minimal government interference? So historically, uh, free banking meant a system in which there wasn't a central bank, but all the types of money, including hand-to-hand -hand currency, were issued by commercial banks. And this was on silver and gold standards. So the most basic money in the system was silver or gold coins, but those weren't convenient for all kinds of payments. Uh, and so banks issued paper money, redeemable for gold or silver coin. Those are called banknotes. And that was the common money in 19th century America and Britain and other countries with advanced banking systems. And of course, banks offered uh, checking accounts uh, as well. But what makes it most distinctive from uh, today's perspective is the idea that the cash in your wallet is issued by commercial banks. There are still a few places in the world where that's true. Uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Hong Kong, there are still private bank notes. But the most important thing about it is that there isn't any central bank, there isn't any government institution that is running a monetary policy the system is self-regulating based on the workings of the gold standard. Uh, and the banks are providing as much money as people want to hold in, in the form of bank issued money. And there are built in mechanisms, which uh, I sort of spent my career trying to understand and describe for limiting the banks to issuing no more than people want to hold. So that's the what, basic idea. Yeah. What would be the advantage of this model over the current model? that we have right now in America? Well, probably the most basic difference is being on a commodity standard rather than a fiat standard provides an anchor uh, to the purchasing power of the monetary unit. So when, when the dollar referred to a certain amount of gold, its purchasing power was a lot more stable than the dollar we have today, which is not backed by any commodity. And so you didn't have 8% inflation the way we do today. Uh, under commodity standards. You had much milder periods of inflation or deflation, but in the long run, the price level was practically constant over long periods of time. And why would we want that over? Because a small amount of inflation seems to be good for an economy in many ways. Would you disagree with that or would you um, not want that as a part of your system? Uh, yeah, I would disagree with that. I don't think there's any reason to want to engineer a positive rate of inflation. Uh, it's okay if the way people enjoy a higher standard of living is by having a, a constant dollar income and yet the prices of goods and services are gradually falling. So that's another way to enjoy a, a rising real income, a, a rising standard of living. Uh, and that was the case over you know, decades uh, under the gold standard and seemed to work pretty well. Economic growth was pretty robust. So, so I've read a number of papers that say a small amount of inflation can help many things. Why it's a common you, view, yeah. Why do you think that view is held and why do you think it is incorrect? I think there's maybe some truth to it under a fiat regime, uh, especially one in which people have become accustomed to expecting a little bit of inflation. Uh, and when that's sort of built into the psychology, then people think they're falling behind if they're not constantly getting a raise. And, and it's true. If prices are rising at 2% a year, then you need raises of 2% a year uh, to keep up. Um, I think there's concern about the stickiness of prices and wages and a slightly positive rate of inflation is supposed to make it possible to reduce relative price of something 
without its dollar price going down because other prices are rising. Uh, but that kind of stickiness is kind of created by a system in which the average level of prices is rising. So I don't think it's uh, you know a fact of nature that uh, prices can't adjust downward against a background of a stable average level of prices. Uh, and that's what historical experience tells us. People were more willing to accept uh, flat or even nominal wage cuts in a system where average prices were not rising. My understanding is that with inflation, it means the money in your bank account really loses value over time. And so it incentivizes people to spend more money and driving economic growth seems to be faster as long as there's less money in savings accounts and more money being spent um, to produce uh, consumer demand, essentially. Uh, do you think that is an accurate or inaccurate way to portray the value of inflation? I think that's an inaccurate way. Uh it's true that at a high rate of inflation, people don't want to hold as much money relative to their income. They economize on cash balances. And you can describe that as the velocity of money being higher, which is the idea of money turning over more times per year. Each dollar is spent more times per year. Uh, but that's actually a, a cost to the economy. For people to economize on their money balances, they hold less than they would really like to hold or would hold if the cost of holding were lower. And so they get less, in a, in a sense, they get less service out of money holding uh, and they incur more costs to keep their money balances low. Uh, moving money back and forth to non-money assets, uh, mutual funds or other kinds of savings vehicles. Uh, you see this in a really extreme way, of course, in a hyperinflation where people try to keep their money balances to you know, extremely low levels, but that creates an awful lot of inconvenience. People hurrying to spend everything they get and trying to delay every payment they make so that it will be less in real terms. Uh, I think it's okay for people to have larger balances. They're still going to spend most of their income. Uh, the idea that we constantly need to juke spending to keep the economy growing is, I think, a mistake. The long run growth of the economy depends on real resources. It, growth is not produced by adding more zeros to the monetary unit. It's produced by having better skilled labor, more capital equipment, better technology, those kind of things. Uh, so you can't produce real growth just by printing more pieces of paper or adding more zeros to bank accounts. All right. I agree that just adding more zeros doesn't do anything uh, in the context of adding value to an economy. But if it encourages people to spend money, it seems like if we compare two hypothetical economies, one where people are spending 90 something percent of their income and one where they're saving 30 percent or something, the economy where everyone is, if they start off with the exact same GDP or whatever, mm -hmm. the economy that is spending 90% of all of its income seems like it's going to grow more, that there's going to be more things happening with the money, more investment happening with the money, um, more companies being growing and different kinds of technology being developed. It seems like that the one where they're spending money is going to have a significant advantage of growth over the one where there's a large portion in savings. Well, we need to distinguish between saving and the hoarding of money. So if people are taking their income and just putting it under their mattress, that's not going to promote investment. But when they put their money in the bank or when they save it in pension plans, that's going to finance investment. Investment needs to be financed by people's savings. Right? The, it's a condition for macroeconomic equilibrium that investment equals savings. So the investment has to be financed by savings. And economies where there's a high savings rate there's a high capital accumulation rate, there you get stronger economic growth. Uh, Cross-country studies are pretty clear about that. So encouraging people not to save is not a way to promote prosperity. Well, sure, as long as the banks can reinvest your money. Um, but in that context, it seems like you need something that's not 
uh, centralized on like a gold standard or something. The fiat currency seems to allow for a lot higher amounts of uh, investment through like debts and just making up money like what banks do. Do you think that with a kind of a gold standard system that banks would be able to invest to the same degree they do in our debt based economy? Yeah. Uh, a gold standard doesn't mean that people only use gold coins, mostly historically. They, they used very few gold coins. The gold coins were in bank vaults and most of the money people were using was IOUs from the banks. Banknotes are debt instruments, so are checking accounts. And so they're financing bank lending on the other side of the balance sheet. So compared to a gold coin economy, and Adam Smith made this argument in the way back in the Wealth of Nations, if you substitute banknotes for gold coins, you get more uh, financing for investment. You can substitute what he called a dead stock of a big pile of gold coins for an active stock. Of, you can export the coins and import raw materials and machines and make more stuff. So a gold standard doesn't mean you don't have as, as vigorous a financial sector. We certainly had a vigorous financial sector uh, under the classical gold standard right in the years before the First World War. Uh, that was not a problem at all. So if the model is so successful, why do so few countries adopt such a similar system and prioritize a more of the kind of fiat currency debt based system we have today? That's a very good question. Uh, I don't think it was lack of economic success. I think it was the constraint that the gold standard puts on government finance. So all the combatant countries in Europe left the gold standard in the First World War in order to print more money to finance their war uh, expenditures. And they never really got back because it was so nice to have a way for the government to borrow money uh, at a moment's notice or to print money at a moment's notice uh, to finance expenditures. And so I think that's the problem. Uh, a gold standard constrains governments and government don't like to have their spending constrained in that way. Is that a good thing though, to have the ability to be able to spend large sums of money on a moment's notice, like for any kind of emergency funds or military funds or scientific funds. It seems like having that, if we again compare it to hypothetical governments, one that has that and one that does not, yeah. the one that has that ability seems like it would have an advantage overall. Yeah, I think if, if uh, the country's invaded, you want to be able to muster resources quickly, sure. Uh, but in a system where a government can borrow, and today we have, of course, a very thick market, uh, international market for sovereign debt, uh, that's possible. You don't need to print money to finance the spending. You can do it with borrowing. Uh, so I don't see it being a, a sort of crippling constraint. Um, the countries that have survived are the ones that have the real, uh, that has survived invasion, are the ones that have the real resources to mount a defense. Uh, the printing press does not provide the real resources, although it, it helps a government mobilize resources a government with a good credit rating can do it by borrowing. And and then there's when it borrows to fight a war or a flood or some other emergency, there's an expectation by the people who buy the bonds that the government will pay them back. Uh, so it, it's important and under uh, to have a good credit rating. And so a gold standard helped to maintain the uh, how do you want to put it, the, the fiscal integrity of governments, not going too far into debt, not borrowing money for frivolous purposes or for aggressive wars. Uh, so two questions there. One would be, why don't you think the governments in like World War One, World War Two, took that approach? And second is, is doesn't the ability to use frivolous money in this way also, again, promote growth. It seems like the rate of the debt and the deficit growing hasn't really increased the interest rate that governments have to pay that much. So governments really don't care because it's like in, unless the interest payments have to go up by a significant margin, then it really doesn't matter how big the number is that we owe as long as we can maintain like a, a favorable rate of payment. Uh, that's several questions. Let me... Uh... <laughs> 
Yeah, so it's true that the federal government, the U.S. federal government has borrowed a lot of money in recent years and has not seen the interest rate it pays go up much. And so it looks like uh, everything's fine. But there have been other governments that have run into uh, a kind of fiscal wall or a debt trap, it's sometimes called, where they saturate the international market for their debt and then they can't buy borrow more except at increasingly high interest rates. So we saw that in Greece and we saw that in Spain. Uh, in Greece, they defaulted on their debt. In Spain, they were able to muddle through, uh, although they're still carrying a lot of debt. And it constrains what the government can spend on other things, on more worthwhile projects, if it's devoting a lot of its budget to debt service. So the problem of piling up debt is that it increases debt service as a share of the government budget. Uh, so in the U.S., we haven't reached the point where we're constrained in the amount the government can borrow by a rising interest rate. But there's some point out there where we will saturate the international market for U.S. debt. And so we want to stay well to the uh, prudent side of that problem. Uh, in the First World War, it, uh, I'm not sure, I, I, I have to study it more closely to know why they didn't think they could finance uh, their undertakings with debt rather than by printing money. Uh, and Printing money only raises a certain amount of resources uh, from the economy and it levies a pretty terrible tax on the public in, in the course of doing so. So it's not really a desirable way to raise money. Uh, in the US, we had 20% inflation as a result of World War I financing by printing money. Uh, European countries had even more, and of course, hyperinflation in Germany. So do you know of any governments who have used your method to be able to finance a war without doing the fiat currency printing money? Well, before the First World War, um, countries borrowed in, the, in international markets to finance at least defensive undertakings. And, and I guess the British government borrowed money to finance even uh, sort of imperial colonial expeditions. But they had the, there was kind of a, an implicit uh, rule that if you borrow in wartime, you pay it back when the war is over. And so if you do that, you, you maintain your credit rating and you're able to borrow the next time. So I would say that was the, the, the main way governments operated before the First World War. So do you think just the magnitude of the war is what encouraged them to switch to the fiat currency? I would guess that's part of it, sure. Uh, before the First World War, of course, the U.S. went off the gold standard during the Civil War, which was also an unusually large war. Uh, but we went back on the gold standard after the war by running budget surpluses and paying down the debt and shrinking the quantity of greenbacks in circulation until their purchasing power rose back up to the purchasing power of gold. Uh, you mentioned that there's a point where we could saturate the market with debt. Um, what exactly, what point do you think that would be? So like since American, the, the USD is like 60% of the world's banking banknotes around the world. And so it seems unlikely that that's going to happen anytime soon when the banks use those as a reserve currency. What do you think it would take for us to reach that point? Well, a sign that you're uh, approaching that point is when you start paying an interest rate uh, that's higher than your real growth rate. Uh, because when that happens, even if you run budget balance from then on, the debt will grow faster than the economy because you're rolling it over at a higher interest rate than the economy is growing. So when you begin to see the interest rate rising toward uh, the growth rate, then you're starting to get trouble. Now in the US, uh, a growth rate used to be about 3% a year in real terms. 
in the last 15 years, it's been more like 2%. So we're getting closer to uh, the danger zone simply because our growth rate has slowed down. So we want to make sure the government uh, is not going to borrow so much as to raise the real interest rate it pays above 2%. Right now, it's negative. So we're pretty far from uh, that problem. How, how, what exactly would that mean in terms of debt? Like, how big would the number have to be to get to that point? I don't know. I mean, we, we would have to be in a part of the market demand curve where we've never been. Uh, but we can look at other countries. Uh, in Greece, they pretty much saturated the market for their debt when they were uh, had a debt to GDP ratio of about 120%. Um, but Japan has 200% and, and they haven't triggered that uh, kind of debt trap. So partly it depends on how much saving the domestic public does and partly it depends on whether your currency is regarded as a safe haven which the US dollar thankfully still is, but we don't want to endanger that. What are some other suggestions you would have to improve our economic standing? Well, there are all kinds of uh, reforms or improvements that we could make in Federal Reserve policy short of uh, switching to a commodity standard or uh, you know, going off a fiat standard. There are ways to improve the performance of a fiat standard by giving the Fed in uh, stronger limits on its discretion, that is imposing some kind of monetary rule on it so that its behavior is more predictable and less prone to these kind of inflationary bouts that we're currently in. Uh, so that would be th uh, one suggestion. That probably the best suggestion I've heard is to have the Fed explicitly target the growth of total spending in the economy or nominal GDP, uh, as it's called. What would what does that mean? Have it target the rate of what? Uh, <laughs> total spending or nominal GDP. So GDP is the value of all the goods and services uh, newly produced in the economy. And nominal means we value them uh, at their current dollar prices rather than deflating to adjust for inflation. If we keep nominal GDP on a smooth growth path, uh, then we avoid periods of high inflation. The Fed would see nominal GDP rising faster than normal, then it, it, uh, it is instructed, I guess I could say, uh, to moderate the growth of uh, the money supply. But this kind of target doesn't prevent the Fed from expanding the money supply when it's really warranted to do so, uh, as in the first year of the pandemic. So in the first year of the pandemic, people started hoarding money in vast quantities. It was appropriate for the Fed to expand the quantity of money the public had to hold so that they didn't have to cut back on their spending in order to accumulate money balances. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't correct course when the public stopped hoarding money, and now the public is spending out of those hoards, and so the Fed needs to tighten monetary policy. But they've been kind of making it up as they go along. They were only looking at inflation, and as long as inflation was low, they didn't think they needed to constrain money growth. Uh, do you think that's the primary cause of inflation is the fact that people were hoarding money, saving money in COVID? No, no, that was restraining inflation. That was keeping it low. Uh, and then spending it now. That yeah, it, I think that's the primary cause right now. People are spending off the money they accumulated when the Fed was highly expansionary in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and the Fed yeah. hasn't hasn't corrected course yet. Do you have figures for that? Like how much people were saving compared to what they were normally saving? And so we're not talking about saving in the sense of putting it in a bank account. We're talking about people holding more money relative to their spending. So uh, the velocity of M2 is the way economists usually measure that. And the velocity of M2 fell about 25%. So people were holding about 25% more money relative to their spending. Uh, and the Fed provided that. A, with a slight lag, but I give them credit for pretty promptly 
uh, increasing the money supply and thereby stabilizing uh, total spending. Uh, so the recession was uh, very short. Uh, but now we've got the, an overhang of excess money balances. So monetary policy still has a long way to go to get back to being consistent with bringing inflation down to 2%. How long do you think it would take for people to spend off all the money they've saved? Uh, well, I haven't thought about uh, sort of that in that magnitude, but that's looking like we're going to have, you know, elevated inflation uh, for another year or two. Um, and do you think that's it? Do you think it's going to stop at that point? Well, it depends on what the Fed does. But if the Fed uh, stops expanding the money supply, then, yeah, it should come back down. What other policy ideas do you have that would be interesting? <laughs> Well, um, outside of outside of the monetary system, of course, there are a lot of ways to improve the important uh, the performance of the economy by removing particularly uh, burdensome taxes taxes that have large deadweight costs compared to the amount of revenue they raise, um, and removing you know red tape and regulation that uh, restrict competition. Um, introducing more competition into markets where it's restricted. Um, I mean, those so would like be my, my general kinds of suggestions. Sugar subsidies, an excellent example. Tariffs, um, reducing tariffs would be important, sure. So what are the kind of things, the policies that you say tax things that, uh, for what, what kind of taxes do you think would be good examples that we should get rid of? Well, taxes on savings, um, taxes on capital gains. I mean, we tax people when they earn their income. We shouldn't tax them again when the savings they make out of that income uh, are yielding interest to them. I, so going back to the earlier question of whether savings is a good thing for the economy, it is a good thing for the economy because savings is what finances capital accumulation. So I think we have uh, less capital accumulation than we would have if we had a more neutral uh, taxation policy, that is tax income once, uh, not twice. So what what do you mean by tax income twice? Could you explain to me how that works? Okay, so you, you earn $1,000, you pay an income tax on that. If you put the $1,000 in the bank, you're not earning much interest these days, but suppose you were earning uh, four percent interest. You're paying a tax on that four percent interest. Uh, so, in a sense, you're being taxed twice on the income you originally earned, because the time value of money uh, that you've accumulated uh, is being taxed again, and so that discourages saving relative to putting the money into something else, uh, taking a vacation or buying a new refrigerator. Gotcha. Now, I hadn't even, hadn't, even, hadn't even thought of that where uh, the interest counts as like a, some kind of an income that you have to pay taxes on. Yeah. What other kinds of taxes should we get rid of? <laughs> well, as many as we can. Uh, it, it's going to depend on how big a government you want, right? So the, you need taxes uh, to the extent that government is uh, spending uh, real resources, or uh, as governments, our federal government mostly does, uh, making transfer payments. Uh, if if you think the federal government can be shrunk, then there are all kinds of taxes we can reduce, and we can reduce marginal tax rates uh, in a way that you know lets people keep more of their income. Uh, But if, if government is going to continue to spend more than, I don't know, 25% of GDP, which it has the last few years, and this goes back to the last years of the Trump administration, uh, they seem to be reluctant to collect the taxes, to, but happy to vote for more spending. And so we got the deficit, sorry, the, the ratio of debt 
to GDP rising even at the end of the expansion before the pandemic, which is sort of not the way to maintain uh, a fiscally healthy uh, budget. Do you think governments should be smaller in general? Do you think there are any advantages to having larger governments? I think in general, smaller. I think uh, people shepherd their own money more carefully than when they're spending their own money uh, than government bureaucrats do when they're spending other people's money. If you're spending other people's money, there's no end of improvements you can make by spending a little bit more. But the little bit more from the point of view of taxpayers is often not worth the additional expense. Uh, but the, the people proposing the spending or administering the spending uh, don't feel that pain. Uh, and so they're always happy to expand programs uh, even beyond the point where the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost. Is there like, when I think of government spending, I know most of it's pretty wasteful, but I think there are certain cases where it's very beneficial. For example, research and development is, if you were going to write research and development into a business plan, like I have a 99% chance of failure, but I still need to just experiment to try to get that 1% of some gold new technological discovery. Right. And we need somebody to finance that. And the government right. seems to be very well suited to be able to finance those kinds of research and development ventures that are most likely going to fail, but we need the research to be able to make new kinds of technological progress. Well, most commercial research and development is financed by venture capital, not by the government. The government does finance a lot of research and as an academic, we all say hooray for the National Science Foundation uh, to fund what the research we want to do but that research may or may not have any payoff in terms of uh, new inventions that actually provide tangible benefits. Uh, there are all kinds of cases that people trot out of government funded research projects that just seem silly. Uh, there have been cases where the government has funded basic research that has turned out to have a high payoff. I just think we need to look at the average payoff, not just uh, cherry pick examples. And I think we'll find that the rate of return is lower than it is in the private sector, where, of course, they have an incentive to uh, try to find projects that are actually going to pay off. Sure. But I don't see it as necessarily a bad thing. Like, for example, the Large Hadron Collider uh, in Switzerland or whatever, it doesn't really have much of a payoff. Like, we, we can do nothing with this information of smashing particles together. We can't build anything with it yet. Um, it's only a hope that we can use this information 50 years in the future or something. So it's a hundred billion dollar sinkhole of money that's not going to make any profit, essentially. Um, so but so there, has, there has to be cr some criterion as to whether that's worth it, right? Yeah. So how do we judge whether that's worth it? it well, I think we're kind of at sea without a compass if we're trying to imagine what it's the knowledge is going to bring us in the future. We don't know. Yeah, like I certain, think that just just the fact scientific inve invention and progress in and of itself seems to be worth it based off of past history. Like science has done everything for us, improved our lives more than anything else, everything else combined. And so making progress in scientific discoveries to try to increase everything, the quality of our lives, life expectancy, cure death, essentially, any kind of scientific discovery we can to better understand the nature around us seems to be like a worthy investment. And so the fact that we know how powerful science is as a tool seems to be a justification to invest this money in it, even if it is a complete bust in the end. I would say up to a point, you have a good case, but it's hard to know when we've gone beyond that point. And there's lots of examples of government funded research, which doesn't uh, especially in the social sciences where I operate, which doesn't seem to have much justification in terms of having any payoff in the future uh, for the people who are financing it. Whereas, where, whereas with venture capital, uh, they're risking their own money. So uh, that's their problem to make sure that they're finding projects that actually have some uh, practical payoff. Uh, but you wouldn't be against the Lord, more like sci the hard sciencey ones like CERN, those kinds uh, of things. 
No, up to a point, uh, they, they, they provide some valuable uh, information. So, but up to a point. So, it, but you know, the kind of money that is spent on those kind of projects is a tiny, tiny fraction of the U.S. government budget um, or the Euro European Union budget. So, yeah, I don't, I, I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about that as the main source of uh, wasteful spending. Uh, I would focus more on military spending um, and on transfer payments because that's where the big money is. What are transfer payments? So Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid are the big three. So tax money comes in and tax money goes out. The government's not buying goods and services. It's not paying salaries. It's just writing people checks. But aren't those programs beneficial and specifically help the economy? Like if we can improve people's life expectancy, their quality of life, they're more likely to make money and spend money in the economy. So isn't there a net benefit of spending money on healthcare? Uh, there's a benefit of spending money on healthcare, sure, but we want to relate the benefit to uh, the amount that's spent. Uh, so we could shrink uh, Medicare uh, uh, by means testing it, right? So everybody over 65 is enrolled in Medicare, whether they need to be or not, uh, and they get their bills paid by the government, whether they're poor or whether they're rich. So we could save money by means testing, uh, for example. So um, essentially means stop paying for rich people, rich old people? Yeah, basically. I mean, it, it's kind of perverse that rich people, sorry, old people as a class are the richest people in our economy because they've accumulated savings over their lifetime. Now, not all old people are rich. And so if we want to have a safety net, we want to distinguish the those who need the help from those who don't. And uh, Social Security, the same thing. We do tax Social Security payments, but it's still, uh, if we the justification for them is that they provide a safety net, then it's silly to be sending them to everybody. What other costs reducing metrics could we use to reduce the cost of healthcare? Because it seems like a lot of it is pretty important. I know America has lots and lots of waste because it's has a terrible healthcare system, but other countries that have more socialized healthcare seem to do it more efficiently and have better results. And they don't seem to have as much waste um, as we do. Yeah, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, there is a lot of waste in the US system, that's for sure. Um, it's not really a field I've studied much, but uh, if you compare the US to Canada, for example, uh, it's true they spend less in Canada, but they also get less. And that's why Canadians come to the US for some kinds of surgery because the wait list in Canada is so long that you have to live with your painful hip uh, for years before you can get it fixed if you rely on the National Health Service. But I don't see that as necessarily a bad thing. Like if we compare outcomes, uh, for example, um, the life expectancy in Canada is higher than life expectancy in America. And so the outcomes of the healthcare system, even if it has longer wait times is better. And so it seems like a better healthcare system simply by that metric. Um, but what, what about their system would you cut to like reduce the cost there? Well, like I said, we're kind of off of my uh, area of expertise here, but um, I guess as long as people have the option to get private care in Canada, uh, and that seems to be limited by the fact, uh, as judging by the fact that people come to the US uh, to get procedures done, uh, then I guess it's uh, people complain about the wait lists and the, the bureaucratic hassle of it. Uh, as far as the life expectancy, I'm not sure how to explain that. Uh, I guess we might want to look at differences in the age distribution or demographic distribution. 
of the Canadian population. Um, if there's if it's because there's more preventative care there, then that that's a something that the U.S. ought to uh, mimic. And I don't know about yours, but my health insurance company has started pestering me more often <laughs> to get my eyes checked and get my colonoscopy and do this and do that. So uh, there are ways to uh, encourage people to get preventative care uh, in, the, in the system we've got. By, but as I said, the US system is not ideal by any means. Uh, if you look at areas where there's more competition in medical services, if you look at say elective surgeries, uh, plastic surgery, for example, you don't see the kind of inflation we see in other areas of healthcare. Uh, so where it's possible, uh, introducing competition at, and introducing price transparency, which will follow if people are, are paying the bills themselves, uh, would seem to encourage a more efficient uh, use of our healthcare resources. But the system we've got now where you can't even find out what the procedure is gonna cost uh, doesn't encourage people to shop around, does it? For sure. Um, but a question about the elective surgeries thing. So I had a tummy tuck. I used to be extremely overweight and had some a lot of loose skin that I wanted to get rid of. Those are quite expensive uh, in America compared to especially in other countries where they do have socialized medicine. Why do you think that? Really? So you can you can get that in Canada? I believe so. I wasn't looking at Canada. I was looking at Mexico, but because I was looking for the cheaper places. But sure. I believe you can. Um, oh, but but so you can be a medical tourist and go to Mexico and go to a private clinic where they do that kind of thing, yep. or go to India where they do that kind of thing. Sure. Yep. And they have. So there, there's a competitive market for you. Yeah. I don't think it's the Mexican government that's doing the tummy tuck for you. Uh, well, it depends. If you ask them, if you ask them nice enough, they might. Uh, but. Uh, the you mentioned that there wasn't the same level of inflation in these kinds of privatized markets, and that's the part where I'm a little skeptical from my history in that field. The rate and costs of these kinds of elective procedures has gone up quite a bit, and I had to negotiate with my doctor for other kinds of different practices that aren't normally used to get the price down. So, for example, if I asked for staples rather than sutures, that saved me like a few grand because it just takes less time, but it's less pretty. Um, and so the rate of inflation of the cost of these procedures in America, where it is privatized, has increased quite a bit compared to other countries. Um, if you say so, I mean, I'd have to look that up. Is there any healthcare systems that you think do a good job of providing a private option as well as a social option like Singapore's is one that comes to mind for me that I think is a pretty good option of what you're advocating for. Um, I'm not that familiar with the Singapore system. I've been to Switzerland and I got pretty good care there uh, in a private clinic. Awesome. Um, can you tell me more about your books? What was your latest book about? So I have a book, uh, that I just signed a contract on uh, with Cambridge University Press. The title is Better Money, colon, uh, Gold, Fiat, or Bitcoin. So I'm trying to do a head-to-head -head comparison among these sort of three different basic monetary options. Uh, a lot of people who like the gold standard don't know enough about how the current system works or how Bitcoin works. A lot of people who like the current system don't know enough about how the gold standard works or how Bitcoin works. A lot of people who like Bitcoin don't understand the other two systems well enough. So I'm trying to you know, raise the level of the debate. Um, I don't come to a, a sort of slam dunk conclusion, but I'm more sympathetic to the gold standard than most economists are. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to Bitcoin. Uh, Certainly people ought to be free to uh, adopt it. I predict though that it's gonna have a tough road to get people to use it as a money because the price is so volatile. For sure, what are, what are your other thoughts on Bitcoin? Cause mine, I was, I invested in Bitcoin until it got to like 39,000 and pulled out before the big drop, which is, I was really lucky. Good on timing, that good timing. Yeah. Um, so do you think that Bitcoin is a legitimate 
possible future currency or do you think that it's security issues make it not very viable like because if someone steals your bitcoin there's absolutely no way you can get it back can't call a bank can't call a credit card company nothing you can do um does the security concerns with bitcoin make it a less reliable source of uh, monetary system there is that kind of barrier uh to learning how to use bitcoin and learning how to hold it securely so most people for the sake of convenience treat it like a bank deposit they keep their bitcoin in an account at an exchange and that's fine as long as the exchange is solid but we've seen exchanges get hacked uh, and so the more prudent thing is to keep your bitcoin out of the exchange keep it in your own uh, wallet uh, but that it takes a little bit of sophistication so it's kind of a hurdle to get people to adopt bitcoin if you tell them that you're going to have all these you're going to have to learn to do all these procedures to keep it safe uh, yeah so that's been a concern uh, but the major exchanges uh, like coinbase and binance seem to be pretty solid I hope I don't regret having said that at some point in the future. I did stay away from uh, Terra Luna. <laughs> it was clear yeah. that, that it was clear that that was not a sustainable model. Yeah, the Luna coin to what is it, the UST or something? Yeah. So they had two coins that they kind of made up, and each one was supporting the other. Uh, and it it worked under sort of mild conditions, but under stress, the whole thing collapsed because if people doubted one coin, then they were selling it. That caused inflation in the other, then to print more of the other coin, which drove its value down and they got into this downward spiral. So yeah, that was that actually was, that really was not a good design. Now, Bitcoin doesn't have that problem. Bitcoin yeah. does not have a peg to any other currency and its quantity is governed by a very strict release schedule. So they can't just, there is nobody to print up additional Bitcoins the way they were printing up additional Terra. Yeah, the, the Terra thing was actually really interesting. Um, the Chinese guy who started that connection company, it, it would grow really, really big. It was like a $50 billion company or something along those lines. And then some, it seems like some really large investors uh, surreptitiously planned to all release at the same time in order to cause this massive inflation spike and crash the company, which was really interesting the way that they could do that. Yeah, I've heard this theory that there, it, there was an attack on the system, but it's hard to see exactly where the profit is from attacking it. So it seemed to me it was a combination of the decline in the price of Bitcoin, which they were holding as additional backing, and people waking up to the unsustainability of the model, uh, the, the self-feeding nature of the decline in the value of the two coins that were tied together. You don't think that was, they could just short either the company or one of the other coins predicting this fail and make a significant amount of profit just from doing that? Is there a market where you could short Terra? I'm not aware of that. I have no idea. I bet there is. There's a market for everything in in gambling for <laughs> coins. So, what else is in your in your book? What is your? You said you don't come to a firm conclusion. You obviously prefer well, the I'm, gold standard. Yeah. So, uh, I guess the important the policy conclusion is let there be a legally level playing field where people can choose which money they want to hold. So. We've seen in some countries with high inflation, as people start to, say Venezuela, as people started to put themselves on the dollar standard, the government clamped down and made it illegal uh, to use dollars. They eventually relented on that because it, they, they really didn't have much choice. But when the dollar was illegal in Venezuela and yet the inflation was getting up into hyperinflation ranges, people started using Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. They started using gold as a medium of exchange. In the gold mining regions of Venezuela, people were actually paying in flakes of gold because that was more stable uh, in value than the Bolivar. Uh, if fiat monies can keep their inflation rate down to 
then I don't see there being a big demand by anybody to put themselves back on the gold standard or put themselves on a Bitcoin standard. So it's in cases where the fiat monies sort of lose their moorings that we need to be thinking about what are the alternatives. And then we would face a choice between Bitcoin and the gold standard. I think those are the two main alternatives. So it helps to understand how they work and uh, what properties they would have in a world where gold was the primary money or Bitcoin was the primary money. Would you think it would be a good idea to be on like a rotating system where you start with a fiat currency and then when it starts to go bad, you transition to a more fixed currency or a Bitcoin thing and then transition back to a fiat currency to try and take advantages of both systems? Well, in a sense, people do that themselves. When uh, inflation goes up, they resort to some other currency. The main alternative around the world is the U.S. dollar. But with the U.S. dollar uh, hitting 8% inflation, uh, there's a danger that they'll start looking elsewhere. Um, Swiss franc inflation hasn't been quite that high. Right? But there's a there's a network property to money where people want a kind of money that they can spend widely and you can spend the dollar more widely than any other uh, fiat currency. So that's helped the dollar maintain its dominance. But it's possible to lose that if we have too much inflation for too long. Yeah, do you want to talk about any of the other books? Uh, so the Clash of Economic Ideas, which was published in 2012, is a history of economic thought, but only the good parts. <laughs> so I'm not talking about sort of esoteric points in economic theory, but I'm talking about kind of the policy debates that economists have, have had over the years. So it starts out with the Bolshevik Revolution and the debate over whether uh, a purely socialistic uh, economy defined as one where the government owns the means of production uh, is as productive as a private enterprise economy. So there was a big debate in the 1930s over whether you could combine the two and have a kind of market steered form of socialism. Uh, so I talk about that debate. Then I talk about the Great Depression and the policies that were adopted and whether they worked or not and what the arguments were for and against them. Uh, then move on the, the yeah. what was I think it was New Zealand who had like a Roger Nomics kind of a policy to come out of their depression. No, I don't really talk about that case, but that was, of course, much later. That's the uh, 1980s. Uh, but New Zealand is an interesting example of not only what they did on the fiscal side, but what they did on the monetary side. It was the first country to give their central bank an inflation target. So they had inflation of like 14 percent. And they said, we'd like to bring it down, but we don't want to crash the economy. So if we want people to moderate their price hikes, we want price setters to stop raising prices at 14% a year and raise them at only 2% a year. We have to convince them that everybody else is going to do the same. If we want labor unions to stop demanding 14% raises, we need to convince them that inflation is going to come down. So they gave the central bank an inflation target. and uh, made it credible by telling the central bank, if you don't hit your target, you've got to resign. And we're only giving you a limited budget. We're not going to raise your budget if there's inflation. So you're cutting your own salaries in real terms. Uh, and it, it worked pretty well. They brought inflation down to 2% with only a very mild and brief recession. Do you see a pattern among the cases that you did research of certain kinds of policies that tended to work in general and certain kinds of policies that tended not to work in general? Yeah, a kind of theme of the book is that policies that rely on market incentives uh, do better than those that rely on too much direction from the center. Uh, and, and so the in, in the debate over the socialist calculation problem, I think the uh, the people defending the market, the importance of the market pricing system as an important way of communicating information about resource scarcity uh, is more flexible and more accurate 
than having a central planning board uh, trying to set prices and adjust them. And I think historical experience bears that out too. But on the theoretical plane, I think the critics of market socialism had the stronger case. Um, I also talk about the, the history of uh, monetary institutions and on the international level, how the international gold standard worked, what were the theories about how it worked and what were the theories about why uh, Bretton Woods, which replaced it, was not going to work. And uh, those theories were borne out because uh, it eventually fell apart when the US well, it had a series of exchange rate crises of, capped with the US going off its obligation to redeem the dollar for gold. So I try to explain why that was sort of built into the way the system was set up. Uh, and then the debate between monetarists and Keynesians followed about why inflation was rising in the US. What was that? What was the debate between mon the Keynesians and and what was, is there, was there an answer? Did somebody find the answer eventually? Uh, well, I think the the monetarists basically uh, won the day on that. They had an explanation for inflation that the Keynesians didn't have. So by Keynesians, I mean uh, John Maynard Keynes in the general theory, there's no explanation of the price level there. It's just taken for granted that the price level is what it is. Uh, I think because he was thinking in terms of a gold standard where the purchasing power of the monetary unit is determined by the relative price of gold. But when it came to the 1960s, Keynesians were trying to forecast inflation and unemployment, but their only way of forecasting inflation was through the Phillips curve, which thought there was a stable relationship between the inflation rate and the unemployment rate. That blew up in the 1970s. But those whose model of inflation was based on what's called the quantity theory of money, uh, that basically the purchasing power of the dollar goes down if you print more dollars, uh, that explains it. I mean, that it matches the pattern we see across countries and across decades. High inflation countries are countries with rapid money growth. High inflation decades are decades with rapid money growth. Is there like I've I have a thought about this? If you have rapid money growth, but all the money only goes to the top people and never gets trickled down, would you still see a same amount of inflation um, as if you print the money and trickle it down to the lower classes? It seems like you wouldn't. It seems like if a bunch of rich people were just hoarding the money in their bank accounts, you wouldn't see the same level of inflation. Yeah, so the quantity theory kind of abstracts from those kind of questions, but it's a good question because we know that money, when it's added to the economy, isn't, well, except for the PPP checks, <laughs> isn't usually, doesn't show up as an increase in everybody's bank account. It shows up uh, as the Fed first going out and buying securities. Used to be they just bought treasuries. So the first thing that went up was the price of treasury securities. In recent years, they've been buying mortgage-backed securities in a deliberate effort to raise the price of mortgage-backed securities. And this is kind of a credit allocation program in order to make it cheaper to finance housing. So they were trying to prop up the price of houses. And so that benefited people with houses uh, more than people who are renters or certainly people who are homeless. So that's a very uneven way of injecting money into the economy. And how much inflation it generates depends, as you say, on uh, whether the people who get the new money just sit on it or whether they spend it. Uh, if they maintain the same proportion between their cash balances and their spending that they had before the injection, if they return to that after the injection, then it should cause the same amount of spending and therefore the same amount of inflation. Uh, if they sit on it longer while they decide what to spend it on, it may, the inflation may occur more slowly, uh, it may take longer to show up than if you write checks to people who are so cash constrained that they immediately go out and spend it. Then you'll immediately see the inflation. Right. 
Awesome. Well, appreciate it coming on. We've been going for about an hour. It was a really great conversation. Would you like to give people like references or where they can buy your book or find out more about your work? Um, Clash of Economic Ideas is available on Amazon and other fine uh, booksellers. Uh, it's in paperback and it's in uh, e-reader versions, uh, Kindle versions. Um, I have an earlier book, my first book actually called Free Banking in Britain. So that going back to your first questions, if you wanna read about the history of the free banking system in Scotland and the debate over whether to adopt that model in London, where the Bank of England had a monopoly, uh, that's actually available as a free PDF download from uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs. So that's IEA.org.uk. Uh, or just search for free banking in Britain uh, in quotation marks, and you should find that. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. And I will let you go. Thanks for your questions.